Welcome to the Your Money Finance Podcast. I'm David Pratt, along with the president of Everything Financial, Peter Shushecki, and our mortgage professional, very impressive, Vitri Trong. Gentlemen, good to see both of you. Thanks, Dave. Good to see you. Great to be here. Let's not mess around here at all. Let's get right into it. Uh, let's talk about mortgages. Uh, it is the biggest financial decision that you're ever going to make, especially right now. Let's get into it. Yeah, that's why we brought Vitri in, Dave, yeah. because being one of our associate advisors at Everything Financial, so often we find people when they're doing a financial plan with us with our Omni formula, the first time they come in, a lot of times before we really get going on the plan, we need to get them sorted out with the yeah. mortgage. They don't have the right type. They don't know what they have. It's coming up for renewal, possibly, you know, all these different things. So in those cases, you know, we bring in Vitri and that's why we yeah. brought him onto our team a year and a half ago is to make sure we can answer those all important mortgage questions with someone on our team who's not just an advisor, not just another pretty face, <laughs> I think, um, but truly is a mortgage professional. And that's why we had no problem stealing him from his past employer. I did say that out loud. Yesterday. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's been great uh, working with clients. And the biggest thing that struck me is actually how little advice the clients have received on their mortgage and how you ask them how it's been structured. And they just said, that's just what I was told to do. And I, I can't believe it because that's one of the biggest financial vehicles with the house and the mortgage mm -hmm. that you have. You really need to know how to maximize that asset. That wasn't us who told them that though, right, Vitri? That was the big institutions that yeah. told them that the banks, the, the other mortgage brokers. Absolutely. Well, here in BC, as we all know, we are facing a housing affordability crisis and that's the right word. It is a crisis. It means that you cannot afford to make a mistake. Vitri, how do you do that? Uh, yeah, no, the, the, you have to start with the big picture. Yeah. Start with the financial plan. What are you looking to accomplish? Where are you today? And what's the path to get you there? And then you make the mortgage fit into that plan, not the other way around. It just doesn't work. Well, we've got our top 10 things that you need to know about mortgages. So let's get right into it. Gentlemen, here we go. Why is the lowest rate not always the best rate? I mean, you've already confused me. <laughs> yeah, we've been taught that all mortgages in Canada are traded equally, and the only th differentiating one to the other is the rate. Okay. And that is the farthest thing from the truth. Not all rates are, first of all, accessible to you, depending on if you're buying, refinancing, consolidating debt, or just simply renewing. So the rates are all different for all of those scenarios. And if, even if you uh, have the lowest rate in that scenario, you got to look for what the gotchas are. What's the fine print? Because some of them, you can't get out of that mortgage unless you sell your house. Peter, how do you look at this? Well, I, I agree with Vitri 100%. And also, and we're going to get into this in this yeah. podcast here, there's different types of ways to calculate the interest, which I know we're going to get into in some of yeah. our top 10 things. And people aren't told that. It's amazing where everyone says, you know, Five year, five year, five years the rate. That's because yeah, that's yeah. what the mortgage brokers sell on, and I'm sure Vitri will get to the commission part later. Whereas, you know, the facts are everyone changes their house or their financial situation, maybe not their house, but the situation changes enough around every 36 months or so, give or take, that they need to make a change. So if they've all got the five year mortgage, They've still got, you know, 24 months left, which means there's penalties and they need to make a change. So why lock in for five if the average situation changes in three? It doesn't make any sense. Again, you know, get the mortgage to suit the plan. Don't get a mortgage and then try and build a plan around it or your, your hands are going to be tied. Yeah. The five-year plays off everyone's need for safety, yeah. but that, that it does the opposite. Flexibility gives you the most safety. Being able to pivot when life changes gives you the most flexibility. That's or the, the most safety. 
right? That's how you need to build a financial plan. And that's how the mortgage would support that. Well, it really gets us to this whole thing about when you should be getting that variable rate. And again, it's like we're always talking in code here a little bit, but okay, let's talk about variable. You should get a variable rate every time it's available okay. to you. Nice and simple. <laughs> Very simple. <Okay. laughs> and, and can you just lock and, in any time then? If, 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 is it that simple as well? Yeah. If rates, if rates start to go up, you can definitely lock in, but you really do need to have a conversation okay. with your financial specialist just to make sure that's the right thing for you because locking in you know, when rates are going up may not be the best because of the spread. Like you could be jumping a percent, a percent and a half to lock in for what? Yeah. And, and don't fall victim because we know the media, David, <laughs> 40 years in the media, so Something I'm not like picking that. on you here, yeah. but we know the fear mongering that goes on in the media, right? Yeah. Sell with fear. Yeah. And that happened a few weeks before we were recording this podcast where the the fixed rates went up a little bit because of bond yields and there's other factors and the phone rings off the hook because people think their variable rate or we're going to get into the home equity line of credit stuff that's based on simple interest people thought those rates were going up because that's the way it was portrayed in the media that's where you need someone on your side who's not a commission salesperson they're a solution-based like Vitri is a solution-based mortgage broker, solution-based registered financial planner to cut through the noise and the crap. Cause trust me, there's a lot of crap out there. We had to field, I, I don't even know how many calls within a few days because the variable rates and the home equity rates, we'll just say HELOC from now on to keep it short, are tied to the bank of Canada rate. Whereas the locked in rates, maybe Vitri can expand on that a little bit what they're tied into. Yeah, so right now, fixed rates, they've just all gone up. So your average fixed rate is about 2.75%. And at, at the, that's at the banks on average. The average variable rate is just slightly under 1.5%. So uh, that's a 1.25% difference. And they're talking about rate raises next year of three times, which is 0.75%. So 1.5, your current rate plus 0.75 gives you 2.25. So when, when that settles, you're still better off by half a percent on the variable than you are the fixed. Like they would have to raise rates six, seven times for you to just break even. Well, think about that too, Dave. Yeah. What Vidri just said, and, and I, I do math, as you know, for a living, so it's in my yeah. head. So if rates have to go up six times, well, let's say that takes... Let's just say to be aggressive, it takes two years, three, okay. three raises one year, three raises next year to get to where your fixed rate is. Now, if you were locked into a three-year fixed rate, you've only got one year to go. But here's the thing. If you were paying that considerably lower rate over those two years, it's going to take another year or two of the rate even going higher. Ouch to get you to the actual break even point. So we did a number once on this and we were at nine increases over three years to break even. Wow. You can save yourself a lot of money with variable. And as Vitri said, flexibility is the key. That's the ammunition in your pocket. And the more flexible you can be with any financial plan, we're not just talking mortgages, we talk yeah. investments, insurance, you name it. The more flexibility to have, the more it's in con you're in control. Because remember, as we always say, it's your money. And the more you can be in control of your money, the better off you are. Well, with that in mind, and Vitra, I'm going to throw this at you. When do you, when do you just stand up and say, look, I, I need to cancel this mortgage. I'm going to walk away. Yeah, no, life changes yeah. a lot. And especially it seems it's changing more rapidly yeah. uh, today than it was 10 years ago, for sure. You know, um, there could be good things that change in your life. You get a raise, um, maybe you upgrade your house and you have to, change your mortgage that way could be the bad things in life, right? Like you're, if you're in a strata, maybe there's an assessment, uh, you got to come up with 20, 30 grand. Maybe you're in one of these situations where you have a lot of debt that you have to consolidate yeah. now because you're drowning all sorts of things. So, it, you know, every three years or so is when the average Canadian needs to remortgage. So you want a variable rate mortgage just in case that does happen to you because of the flexibility. And what I mean by that is, to cancel that variable rate mortgage, it's only three months of interest 
versus those giant IRD penalties that you hear on the news. That's when you hear people saying, my penalty to cancel my mortgage was $30,000. We had one the other day for $45,000. Wow. Right? So, so you want to avoid that. That's a car. <laughs> Cancellation <laughs> fee is a car. A nice car. <laughs> but yeah. okay, let, let me throw this at you, though, because we're throwing these numbers around. What's, what is the difference between, say, a three-month interest penalty um, and then the, the interest rate differential? I mean, again, I'm, I feel like, like I'm having to learn a new language here. Yeah, so every mortgage payment is divided up into two parts. Like yeah. Part of that payment goes to interest yeah. and part of it goes to principal. And today it's about half and half. Okay. So if your mortgage payment is about $2,000 a month, three months of interest is about $3,000. So compare that to the twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 from the interest rate differential. And how they calculate that is they look at what the rates are today versus what your rate is. And if your rate is significantly higher, they look at all the money they would lose for the next 24 or 30 you know, 36 months, whatever's left on your mortgage term. And they charge you that all of that lost profit all at once. Ouch. It's also Dave Tavitri's credit. He's a little modest on this, but he's got a computer program. And I've seen this in action okay. where people will come in and say, my penalty is X, whatever, on the interest rate differential. Oh, the bank's not really charging me a penalty. They're just <laughs> blending it. <laughs> Blending is a word meaning penalty, and Vitri okay. can actually. So they'll say, "Oh, we're going to get you a quarter percent lower." Woohoo! And then Vitri can actually go in and compare when the break-even point is. So why don't you give the people Vitri a little insight into how you do that? Yeah. So the blend and extend is one of those. I don't. It's good and bad. It's good that you can lower your payments right now lower your rate, pay less interest, but it's bad that you have to keep that higher than market rate for another five years. So um, that's not good. What you want to do is crunch all the numbers and see what happens if you break your mortgage today, get the absolute uh, best mortgage for your situation, maybe not the absolute lowest yeah. rate, but the one for your situation. And then compare the cost benefit of doing that versus the blend and extent. Well, do the penalties differ from bank to bank? Or are they all on the same page? Absolutely, they, they do. do. Great question, Dave. Okay. Yeah. No. So the way the big five banks calculate the interest rate differential is they uh, take what's called the discount off posted. So if the posted rate's 5.25, uh, you never pay that. No one ever pays 5.25, but you got a discount of 2.5% or so to get you to your real rate today to something. They'll take that and they'll factor that in. And that's where you get the really giant penalties. So in mortgage broker world, we do have what's called a monoline lender, okay. which is a Canadian bank that only sells mortgages. That's their only product, monoline. So the way they calculate it is they'll take discounted rate compared to discounted rate. So there is none of this. Uh, you know, the, We gave you this discount off posted, which no one ever pays. So it's a more fair way of doing it. So if you have the choice and you have to get a fixed rate mortgage, get it from one of these monoline mortgage broker banks. Now, Peter, you were throwing out the, the word HELOC, okay? And I, again, I roll my eyes and I go, I, okay, I'll just, I'll just keep quiet on this. But look, why is it that everyone is so divided on whether they're good or bad? And, and try to talk to me in words that I can understand. Please, well, please. It, if I was a cynic. Okay, Really? And, 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 you know, talking about big banks, I would say the reason everyone's so against them from the big bank's point of view okay. is because of the commission structure difference between a five-year fixed rate okay. and the home equity line of credit rate. Now, Vitro will get into the commission part of this more and more. A home equity line of credit gives you the most flexibility. It's also simple interest versus compound interest. But as Vitri said, it's part of your overall plan where some people are very disciplined and very good with a home equity line of credit, but you have to have a registered financial planner who's going to structure it properly to fit you. Because if you don't pay attention, all you, ever, all you will ever do is pay interest, which okay. isn't good 
unless maybe you're in retirement and that gives you more cash flow. So it should be part of the conversation, but I think why it's it's frowned upon or some of the publicity we get from the big institutions, uh, Vitri can expand on the difference of how it's paid. Yeah, so on the bank side, for sure, there's a commission aspect. Um, you get paid less, and, and mortgage brokers, are same, same thing. You get paid less on a home equity line of credit than you do on a fixed rate mortgage or a variable rate mortgage. It's about 30 to 50% less depending on the product. So you'll never get a mortgage broker really sell you a line of credit product because they'll never see you again. <laughs> that, that makes it simple <laughs> to say the least. Okay, now let me throw this. Okay, go ahead, Peter. Well, I was going to say part of it, what it is too, is when we see clients come in, we're not, we're not there to sell them a mortgage. Vitri's not there to sell them a mortgage. He's there to answer questions. And if the mortgage ends up benefiting them, then we'll address it. But a lot of times people will just call us because that's where the conversation starts in the Omni formula plan, because it's coming up for renewal. And Vitri will offer solutions with hybrids of the two, which work out great in a lot of cases. You really get yourself some flexibility on your payments. You pay way more principal down. But people are amazed when they've never even heard these things. So this is my philosophy. Yeah. If, if you're presented with one of these options, whether it's Vitri or you're somewhere not near it, you're going to another firm, whatever the case may be, and you're looking at financial planning, wherever you are, but then all of a sudden the bank says, oh, well, we can do that for you. That's where you put on the running shoes and you run for the door because why didn't they tell you about that product in the first place? Yeah. Oh, guess why? Because they weren't getting paid, yeah. you know? So it's like it's like the old adage, you know, with a car guy goes, let me check with my manager. Yeah. You know, as he's out having in the old days, you see the old movies, he's out having the cigarette around yeah. the corner way back when. You don't do that anymore, of course. It's a different thing no. to do. No. But that's what happens with these people yeah. is, they don't hear about a product because no one wants to tell them. The only time it's brought up is when it looks like they're walking out the door. You want to deal with someone proactive who's looking for solutions to make your life better, not worrying about putting a commission in their pocket. Let's uh, stick. Yeah, Peter. And the other, sorry, no, Dave. Go ahead. I was going to add on to that. The other thing is these places, these banks aren't actually equipped to give advice. The, the guys there, the, the ladies there, they just don't know what they don't know. Uh, like they don't know how to put together a comprehensive financial plan. They don't know how to structure debt properly to get someone ahead instead of constantly in debt. Uh, most mortgage brokers don't know how to do this. And quite frankly, most financial advisors are, are just blind when it comes to death, uh, debt restructuring. Well, Peter was talking about the commissions and I, I, I want to get one thing cleared up. I mean, what are the differences in the commissions versus say a locked in mortgage? So on a locked in mortgage, um, you know, fixed or variable, they pay the same. Okay. You'd, they, you'd be looking at making more, a little bit over 1% on that. Okay. On a line of credit, uh, 0.6 of a percent, something wow. like that. Okay, so that's it. Okay. But it's also the recurring thing, right, VG? Once a person goes down the, the rabbit hole, the line of credit, okay. they tend to stick with some variation of that even though they might do a hybrid, yeah. but there's no recurring thing. And that's what I notice all the time with people like Vitri gets, we get calls from clients. I get emails weekly, no joke. Weekly, we get emails to our firm of people saying, well, my mortgage is up for renewal in nine months, six months, one year, blah, 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 all these different things. It's always different, but the bank's already calling me, offering me something else. Uh. It's like, you know how we talk about, and I know we're going to do this in an upcoming episode, Dave, about how there is no such thing as RSP season. Yeah. There's also no such thing as mortgage season, but Vitra and I laughed about this last month. It, it, we we're looking back at some statistics. Every May seems to be mortgage season where all of a sudden, all the, the fangs are out and everyone wants you to renew or cancel and yeah. lock into a new one. It's like, I don't know this. But you got to wonder if there's a contest at the bank every May on who gets to write the new mortgages because all of a sudden yeah. that seems to be the time of season. So I think what it is is the big push for RSP season ended and now we're going to have a big push for mortgage season for new commissions and, and then September yeah. comes and I don't know yeah. what's next. I know I'm a bit of a Peter, you're not far time. off. Yeah, so there you go. 
I, I used to work inside a bank and literally contests, pizza nights for, for phone calling out. That actually does happen. We don't do that in everything financial. There's no pizza nights because <laughs> the owner's way too cheap to do a pizza night. <laughs> So, but you know, talking about the banks calling clients and getting into lock yeah, in, lock in, yeah. we just had that. Like I, I just took a, a call on that. It's a great example. Like the fellow had ten years left on his mortgage. The bank was all over him to early renew. It's it's probably six months until his mortgage actually re renews, um, and they're offering him this killer rate that's too too good to pass up. And he only has five days to make a decision. So I look at the rate. And it's a decent rate for, you know, give them credit. They stepped up. It's, it's pretty decent. But the thing is, I ask them all these questions. What's your plan? What's the goal? You've got 10 years left. You're, you're sinking all this money into like a 2% investment, i.e. your mortgage rate. What do you want to accomplish? And then we start talking and he wants to increase his retirement fund, max out his TFSAs, potentially buy a second property. And, I, and we look at the mortgage and go, that's not doing any of that for you. It's not going to accomplish any of those things. If we restructure that thing, take it back to 30 years, increase your cash flow, then you can start doing all of these other things and make the next 10 years way better than if you just paid off your mortgage. Gentlemen, we've been talking about you know, young buyers getting into the, the real estate game here. Okay, so here's the next question. How do you go out and build that mortgage when you are, quote unquote, young? No, great question, Dave. And that goes with that uh, mortgage planning yeah. and looking at what you want to accomplish in the future. When you're young, if you have less than 20% down payment, your options are quite limited, right? Yeah. So if you have 5, 10, 15%, you have to get what's called an insured mortgage. So that's with mortgage insurance from CMHC or Sagen or one of these mortgage insurers. So your options there are quite limited. I would take the variable rate almost no matter what. Even if there's a, a very little spread between the fix and the variable, almost always take the variable because you're buying your first home. What do you know about home ownership? Right? We've had clients three years in, first home, we bought the wrong place. <laughs> now what? Yeah. So if they had a fixed rate mortgage, really hard to get out of. We talked about the penalties. But being in a variable rate mortgage, it was super simple. The costs were really low to do. Remember this too. It made me think of a story when Vitri mentioned that. We always hear this from people and, and we're at that time in our lives again where we're hearing it again. It runs in sort of five-year increments in BC where we have these huge increases in real estate prices for a very short period of time. But when you hear the propaganda, it's like this is ongoing and it's always going up at a clip of 20 to 30 percent and people will say oh my gosh my kids or my this or my that will never be able to afford a house again i remember when that was told to me in the 80s it was told to me again later on True. but i remember in 2015 our rates went through the roof and then they settled down for five years so in the end still and i just saw this stat the other day the average price increase of a home in BC, and this includes the Lower Mainland, Dave, 5%. Wow. wow. It's not insane. Yeah. The difference is, and we think it's insane because we're in one of the most expensive cities in the world, but it goes up in big increments and then it levels out or even dips a little. And then it goes up in big increments again and then it levels off for a while. So what happens is when these, these increases happen, especially for young people, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where they all think I better do this now and they don't make the right financial decision. Part of that is because they all expect to live, you know, downtown Vancouver. Yeah. Well, geez, do you remember when you had to move out to way back when I'm talking a couple of generations ago, so I'm going to date myself. Okay. And this is older than me. This is my parents and so on. They had to move out to, New West or oh. Burnaby or, oh gosh, think about it, Coquitlam. I mean, they had to move way out. Well, maybe if you're younger, you might have to move out to, you know, Abbotsford, Alder Grove, Cloverdale, Langley. Um, oh my gosh, Chilliwack. And you might have to commute because that's what you can afford. That's where the purchase yeah. 
of the most important thing, this first home or second or piece of real estate needs to be part of a plan. Because as Vitri said, you have to look at it from 30,000 feet. In other words, yeah. Dave, what are you talking about 30,000 feet for now? I can see it in your face, Dave. You got to look at the big picture yeah. with everything brought to the table, not just I need this house in this 350 square foot condo in False Creek because that's what I want. But you realize, oh, if I move out to Port Coquitlam, I can get 2,300 square feet. And oh, nowadays, remember, a lot of people don't have to work, you know, right there. They're working from home a, a percentage of the time for sure. So again, make it part of the overall plan and look at the big picture before you make a, a false decision. Because Dave, what do you and I always say? We've been saying this for in our years together about okay. When it comes to money and emotional decisions, oh. you don't make the emotional decision Ever. when it comes to a dollar sign because no. you make the wrong decision. Yeah, That's where a good registered financial planner will help you make a logical decision, not an emotional decision. And with that in mind, let me throw this at you, okay? Is bi-weekly the quickest way to pay down the mortgage? Again, we're talking about the business of paying down the mortgage and taking the emotion out. Sorry, can we just go back to that last question? I just had one more point to make on oh, that. Oh, sure. On the, uh... Finish it up and then I'll get back to the bi-weekly. What? <laughs> Add on. Okay. So on the, just getting back to structuring a mortgage for younger uh, people, for younger couples, the biggest thing is to look at what your life is going to look like as you move through yeah. that mortgage. Because yeah. today, in today's day and age, you're not uh, a single income family anymore your dual income. And usually that's 50-50 because you're normally marrying within your peer group. So you and your wife probably make the same. And so what happens when you're young, you make something called babies. And yeah. I have a lot of experience with that. <laughs> I have four kids. He has four kids, yeah. <laughs> so when one spouse, I'm not judging, one spouse goes on parental leave, yeah. what happens to family income? Yikes. It craters, right, yeah, Dave? Cut in half. So, but when you bought that home, you, chances are you probably stretched as far as you can on dual income yeah. to get that home. So how are you going to make those mortgage payments on half the income, right? Because maternity pay isn't very much. It, you know, it's next to nothing, really. So you really do need to structure your mortgage in a way where you can afford those payments as you go through the next few years of your life. And that's where we start to put it together, a hybrid mortgage. And what I mean by that is part of it's a mortgage, but the other half or whatever percentage we come up with is a line of credit. And the line of credit, the benefit is you only pay the interest. You don't make a principal payment. So it cuts your payments down by about 40%. So that could be five, six, seven, maybe a thousand dollars a month that you can reduce your expenses by when one parent is on parental leave. And that can make the difference between um, making all your, uh, meeting all your obligations or going backwards every month on credit cards. Kind of explains why I just got a dog and just let it go yeah, with that. Well, yeah, well, here's what the haters are gonna do, Dave. They're okay. gonna hear Vitri say that and they're gonna go, see, you're not paying anything down. But like Vitri just said, and, and so it doesn't get lost in the noise, you're actually paying off more of your house because you're putting a bigger chunk a lot of times to that non um, HELOC part where you're paying interest and principal. You're getting a better source of cash flow and you're not increasing debt. So what's the point of having a mortgage that's all five year, all fixed, if you're accumulating massive credit card debt at the same time? And we've seen people come in and they go, what do I do? I, I can't get ahead. I'm going further behind because they get stretched too far. A buck only goes so far. So again, biggest purchase of your life. Look at it as the solution, not just a purchase. Moving on now to uh, bi-weekly. The quickest way to pay down your mortgage. Is that the way to go? Bi-weekly? That's what the banks would have you believe. Ah, Dave, the banks. Okay. It's <laughs> path of least resistance, right? Yeah. Theoretically, you make more payments, you should pay it down faster. Yeah. But in actuality, you're paying exactly the same amount of money towards your mortgage in a biweekly versus a monthly. 
the only way to pay down your mortgage faster is to make extra payments. Uh -huh. So that's where the banks have also come up with an accelerated biweekly, which all that means is you're making an extra monthly payment in a calendar year. That's it. Of you're interest and principal, right, Vitri? Yeah, interest and principal. So, so I've run this number, Dave, and I remember I talking about this in our yeah. old days when you and I were on a sports station together. Yes, I and remember those. you can those. make a marginal increase if you yeah. have the discipline or have someone who shows you. Instead of making extra payments of interest and principal, why not find a way to make extra payments of just principal? Now, Vitri, I just put your next comment on a platter for you, so go for it. <laughs> How could you do that, yes. Vitri? Make an extra payment of just principal and even accelerate that payoff even quicker. Tell me there's a way. Well, there, there's two ways. There's the slow way, which yeah. the banks will want you to do, and that's just make a lump sum payment at the end of the year into your mortgage, yeah. which is the slow way of doing it because if you prepay a mortgage like that, Dave, you're buying an investment at the same rate as your mortgage. So if your mortgage rate is 2%, you congratulations, you bought a 2% investment. So there's a better way, and we've run the numbers on this, Peter, where instead of doing that, you use one of the greatest tools the government's ever given us, the tax-free savings account. If you take your extra cash flow and you stick it in there, at some point, that TFSA is gonna to grow to a really, really large number and you may be able to then clear off your mortgage a lot sooner. But, but this isn't the 0.15% TFSA, the big sign you see when you walk in the bank, right, Vitri? This is like a, a TFSA that's more on the retirement side of things. That's right. A TFSA at the banks, you're getting less than 1% typically. And that's why you, when you talk to the, the banks, they're just going, well, what's the point? Why would you do that? Because if, you, if you're in their world, that's 100% true. But by using independent portfolio managers, you're able to take advantage of the market because a TFSA isn't a product. It's just an investment vehicle and the pro different products can go in there. And our portfolio managers can get a much, much better return in line with what the stock market is. Let me throw this by you. Is there a situation where you should never, never pay down your mortgage? Go Vitri, go. The obvious answer. <laughs> the obvious yes. answer is when there's no one to leave it to, Dave. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I guess if if you have no heirs, like what? Why are you paying down this mortgage? What What are you doing that for? Okay. Who's going to benefit? I mean, maybe the SPCA, sure. But well, Dave why are you struggling? Memory, so. yep. Got the dog. <laughs> but think about it, Dave. Oh. Like, he's right. You're 65, 70 years old. Okay, no, about you're, seven. Not you in particular, Dave. I'm talking generalities here. <laughs> but, but you're 65, 70 years old. Okay. You're going to rush and put every dime you have into paying off your house that that will never be paid off because it's going to take you 20-something years. Yeah. Why not look at your house? At least you own it. But go to the lowest payment you can so it's more like a really good cheap rent payment. And And think about it. If you have a nice house, but there's only a couple hundred thousand dollars left on the mortgage, that interest only could be a fraction of what you would get a rent payment for in that area. Take all the extra cash flow that gives you and do this thing. We were able to do this once before. I think it was called travel. Okay. Um, and, and spend the money on yourself because you're not getting any younger. I could be talking about you here, Dave, um, but I'm not picking on you though. Um, no, no. But but think about it. You could you could not pay down your house and go do things and enjoy life. Mm -hmm. Work optional that's lifestyle. This. Part travel, part work. More travel, less work. Because you're not you're not a slave to a mortgage okay. that way. And that's the second scenario, Peter. Good segue. When you've entered retirement, mm -hmm. you should not be paying down your mortgage. You should just go to interest only. Get the extra cash flow and put that towards enjoying retirement. We just did this for a client who they were draining their investments to pay down their mortgage, right? Because their mortgage payment was, I think it was $2,500 a month and they didn't have that much income. 
So they were slowly draining an extra $500 a month from their investments just to put towards the mortgage. And we restructured that into 100% line of credit. They go down to 1500 bucks. We save them $1,000 off their cash flow. So right away, uh, you know, an extra thousand bucks in your cash flow goes a long way. They can stop the extra withdrawals on their investments, let that grow, and have an extra five hundred bucks to play with. So, is downsizing period just a, a good plan? Period. When you, especially you know when you're talking retirement here, is that the way to go? It really depends on what the reasons are okay. for downsizing. Sure. If you're in a really big place and you can't maintain it then probably, sure. but if you're doing it for financial reasons, that's really never a good idea because you're going to be really unhappy moving out of a neighborhood that you know and love, yeah. uh, your neighbors who you know and can trust, you're losing your entire support system by downsizing for the money. And that's where we have conversations with people, like maybe go interest only, maybe we find another way to make this mortgage payment and keep you in that home. Remember too, Dave, and this is seriousness. Okay. Hard to believe, I know, with me. But the three biggest stresses in life. Okay. Loss of a spouse. Yeah. But let's actually, let's go to that. We'll make that one number three. Let's go number one. Loss of a job. Because we're talking about downsizing, right? So loss of a job, a.k.a. retirement. Okay. So that's very stressful because people, even though it sounds great, it can be very stressful on people in retirement. You just don't sure. know how to deal with it. It's a whole different thing from what you've been doing for the past 40 years, let's say. So that's number one. Then you add downsizing because the second biggest thing is moving. So you retire, lose your job. You're going to move, pick up where you've lived for 20 years or something like that and built you know, the relationships and a home and the support structure around you with all your friends and everything else. So now you're going to add moving in. And as I alluded to earlier and jump the gun, then number three, loss of a spouse, because one of you is going to kill each other. If you do those other two things at the same time, you're going to be yeah. at each other's throats. Yeah. So try to not, don't use downsizing as part of a retirement plan. Because here's what I've seen in 31 years of doing this. Okay. 99 times out of 100, People may downsize, but they don't down price, right? V tree, it's 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 a, it's a lateral move <laughs> yeah. to the new shiny toy because they've been in the same house for thirty years or twenty years, and now they want, oh, we're going to downsize. But their million and a half house house went to a million and a half dollar newer condo or newer townhouse or newer something somewhere else. So they don't actually put yeah. extra money in their pocket; they just get a new shiny toy. Yeah. Well, especially in this market, like, what are you going to downsize to? And that's been the biggest question of people trying to do that. Where are you going to go? Like, everything is kind of in, in the same price range now. Here's a, here's a funny one for you too, Dave. I know these people who did, did the, though they didn't downsize. What they did is they outright sold their house that they owned outright. They, they owned it wow. they completely. And they went and rented a place that was all they needed. And their kids all, and their good friend who was a real estate salesperson, what do you do when you're paying someone else's rent? And you were in a debt-free situation with your home. And, and I, I never forget this. The person said to them, and I was there, debt-free? You're all idiots, he said. And he started adding in property tax, maintenance on the home, this you know utilities, blah, 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 blah. And he came up with a figure. And the figure he came up with was more than he was paying for the all two-bedroom plus den rental that him and his wife moved into. And then what they, they banked all the money so they could travel a ton, yeah. like a ton. This was before COVID hit and they're, and they're just booked a whole bunch of more trips now that COVID's, you know, at least weaning its way out of our lives somewhat. Yeah. But they said, this is the most freedom because guess what? All we have to do is turn the key and leave and go to Mexico for three or four months, which they were doing. And they're going to do again. They booked another one. They said, because the house is someone else's problem. So there's that way to look at it too. So again, really what we're getting at is getting someone there who's independent, not trying to sell you something and can present all these ideas to you. And it's our fiduciary duty as registered financial planners is not to look at what's our in our best interest. It's to look at, look at what's in your best interest is going to allow you to achieve your goal. So you got to look at the big picture, as I said earlier, from 30,000 feet. What about reverse mortgages? Let's go there. Well, that's one of the, the tools that we actually use yeah. to keep people in their home. It's not the first arrow in our quiver, 
but it's definitely a useful tool there. And it's been really misunderstood in just in the media. Um, a lot of banks shy away from recommend it. There's just a lot of misinformation on it. Reverse mortgage, very simply, Dave, it's a mortgage where the payments are optional. If you don't make the payments, the interest adds on to your yeah. mortgage. Therefore, if you don't make the payments in a long time, the mortgage balance goes up instead of down. And that's the only reason it's called a reverse mortgage. That's it. Uh, let's get on to the whole idea of the mortgage in terms of, you know, is it tax deductible? Is there a benefit there? You start, Vitri. Go ahead. It's all yours, baby. It's all yours. <laughs> no pressure, Vitri. No pressure. None. The boss is watching. Yeah, no. <laughs> there's there's a couple of times. There's a couple of ways in Canada to deduct your mortgage. Okay. Well, the first way, the way most people do it, is they take their mortgage or money out of their home to buy another rental property. Right? That's the most common way okay. we see in Canada is to take that and buy an investment property, and that becomes tax deductible. The second way, and I know you guys got a podcast on this, is to create the tax deductible mortgage strategy. And I'll let Peter take that one. Yeah. And we've talked about that one, Dave, before. Um, people don't even know it exists. It's been around for well over about 22, 23 years. I first heard about it from an employee from CRA who was a client. And it's amazing. if it, and, and there's a few different ways to do this. But Mr. Excel Specialist Extraordinaire, Vitri Trong has with our company created a couple computer programs to add to our Omni formula okay. that we can actually show you pros and cons of starting to make your mortgage tax deductible. But basically what you're doing is, you know, maybe you get an inheritance or something, you pay down some of your mortgage, then you can later on 31 days later, but there's, there's a few other rules. That's why we did a whole separate podcast on it, but invest some money to put it bluntly though, if it's the right fit for you, you can knock years off your mortgage through tax savings from the government that you never thought were even possible. Now there is certain structures, certain rules, et cetera. So look in our library of podcasts where we expand on this, but if you're not sure, give us a call at everything financial and see, because if it doesn't work and it doesn't fit for you, we're obligated to tell you this is not right for you. Again, we're there to create solutions and look at all the pros and cons, but you should at least have the ammunition to know that if you fall into the right category, you have the right things working for you, writing off that interest on your mortgage may be a very sound possibility. And think about this. If you're in a tax bracket well over 40, approaching 50%, and, you, and Vitri said earlier, roughly nowadays, about half your payment is interest. And let's use that example Vitri used earlier. $2,000 is your mortgage payment. $1,000 of that is interest. Could you imagine in the perfect world that $1,000 a month, if it was all tax deductible, that's a $12,000 tax deduction at the end of the year. And if you were in a 40% tax bracket, how much money you're getting back in income tax, your tax savings is enormous. And then take that tax savings and put it against the principal of your mortgage. When people see this on the computer program we've created with our Omni formula, it is mind blowing. And people just go, holy crap. Again, though, it's a whole conversation because we're very quick to point out Pros and cons, not for everyone. There is rules around it with CRA to make sure it's applicable, but it's definitely one of those conversations worth having. And it might not be right for you now, but it might be right for you in three or four years where you can work towards it. And I tell you what, there's lots of ways to make money. Rate of return, even though when the markets are great, you'd think this is an easy thing. It's not easy. Fees and tax savings. So when you can take your biggest asset and one of your biggest financial decisions, i.e. the mortgage, and turn it into a tax deductible item, oh, that's that's like, well, that's money in your pocket. That's huge. If people want to learn more about mortgages, what, what should they do? Call Vitri. Don't call me. <laughs> I was already <laughs> looking at Vitri. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to Vitri. Everythingfinancial.com. Go to everythingfinancial.com. Okay. Send us an email. Uh, one of our team there will put you in touch with Vitri 
or depending what else your questions are, any one of the rest of our teams. And, and even though Vitri does a lot of our meetings and a lot of our introductory meetings, all our meetings with our Omni formula, and we're creating a plan for you. If you get me or one of our other advisors and we find in the, in the discussion that we need to pivot and really answer a lot of specific mortgage questions, we don't hesitate to bring Vitri into the conversation right away. Vitri, before we, we leave you, I understand you are a Canuck fan. And I know that you have suffered, my son. I understand you have suffered. So we really do appreciate you coming here and spending some time knowing the pain that you're going through. We really do appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. Okay. I've also gone out and become an Abbotsford Canucks fan. Oh, good. So that's worked and, out really well. What do better. I say, Dave, about now that you're an Abbotsford Canuck fan? You've got a 50% chance of cheering for one good Canuck team or a 100% chance that you're going to cheer for two bad Canuck teams. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm a cynic, but there's just nothing bright in the future at the moment. Now, remember, this podcast is from the end of 2021. So if yeah. you pick this up online in three or four years from now, yeah. well, we could still be telling it. No, like it's, no. it it's still could be the same. Yeah, 50 years and counting. No, it'll just keep rolling along. Uh, thanks, gentlemen, so much for this. This has just been a blast. Really enjoyed this a ton. Uh, we're going to be back soon with episode eight. And thanks for following us on your favorite podcast platform and YouTube. If you've got a question for Peter, all you have to do is just go to yourmoneyandeverythingfinancial.com. Gentlemen, again, thanks so much. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Dave.